Hello. So we are in different locations for this presentation. So bear with us as we're trying to just make sure that we're all on the same page as far as uh, moving the slides and whatnot. But um, just wanted to start off by introducing ourselves. So I'm going to turn it over to Grace. Hi, everyone. My name is Grace LaFoe, and I'm a second year speech language pathology master's student at SIUC. Um, I'm also taking courses to be a board certified behavior analyst so I can be a dual certified professional. Um, and some of my interests include augmentative and alternative communication, preference assessment, functional communication training for challenging behavior and interprofessional collaboration. Sorry, I'm going to, uh, Manish, do you want to go ahead and introduce? I'm going to switch the screen sharing just for a second while you introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. My name is Manish Goyal. I'm a doctoral candidate at SIU and a BCBA. Um, I've applied behavioral principles across a diverse uh, area and industry, I guess. Um, I've applied it in theater, I've applied it in OBM, and with uh, children and adults diagnosed with autism and other mental health disorders. Um, my specific areas of interest and in research are um, understanding the conditions under which we begin to follow rules or you know the conditions under which rules control our behavior, how the rule control breaks down, and then how we learn to um, follow rules in different settings without having been trained to do so. And I'm gonna pass the baton on to uh, Connor, I guess. Hello everyone, my name is Connor Iyer. I'm a recent graduate uh, of the program here at SIU, and I'm currently working as a behavior analysis and therapy clinical supervisor. I'll be starting my um, doctor of psychology and clinical psychology with a specialization in behavior analysis the next semester at Missouri State University. and. Um, recently, I've been working in various applied um, behavior analytic research projects under the mentorship of Dr. Leslie Schaller. Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully you guys can see the slides okay. Um, we are not able to see you, but uh, we are here, and I'm Dr. Schaller, as Connor mentioned. Um, so I'm one of the faculty supervisors for the behavior analysis and therapy program, and also supervise the master's and uh, doctoral students here at the Center for Autism Spectrum Disorders, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute, um, but just wanted to do a brief introduction to who we are before we start. Um, so I'll be controlling the slides, um, but Grace is going to start us off. And thank you all for attending today. Um, yeah. And we cannot see the slides before yeah. we get started. Oh, uh, hold on. Sorry, I thought you guys could see it. may not be able to do preventer review, but that is okay if not. Can you guys see it? Um, we see presenter view. Okay. I'll just do the regular view because um, we don't have dual screens here. So, all right. There we go. You should be able to see now. Yep, looks good. Um, okay, so just to start us off, we wanted to say thank you, TAP, um, because at SIU CAST, we are our funding is provided in whole or in part by the Autism Program of Illinois and the Illinois Department of Human Services. So thank you very much. Okay, and just to give us a little bit of background on what we do at SIUC CAST, um, so the to. Um, the SIU Center for Autism Spectrum Disorders, which we will refer to as CAST, um, we provide services for individuals with autism spectrum disorder within the Southern Illinois area. And our focus is on interprofessional training and research for students um, while we're providing high quality services. And overall, CAST focuses on community circuit service for invo and involvement, student training, and research. And so we have a couple pictures of some of our clinicians here, as well as some of our clients. Um, and as mentioned before, with the funding that TAP provides CAST, we are able to provide services including trainings, screenings, and diagnostics for autism, um, individual therapy, including speech therapy and applied behavior analysis therapy, um, student training, and consultations. And our center has faculty and students from clinical psychology, behavior analysis and therapy, and speech language pathology programs. 
Okay, so to give you a little bit of a sneak peek into our presentation, um, here are some of our learning outcomes. Um, we hope that at the end of this presentation, you will have learned about incorporating instructive feedback to increase communication skills, identifying barriers to measuring or teaching non-target um, skills during instructive feedback, and considering the role that client preference plays while designing instructional procedures. Okay. Um, to start off with a little bit of background, um, according to the DSM-5, people diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder may exhibit deficits in social communication, social interaction, and repetitive patterns of behavior, amongst others. Um, and while speech and language impairments used to be part of the diagnostic criteria, it's no longer required um, for a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. But we do know that many individuals present with delayed or impaired de development of communication skills. And as a result, we can see this affect their ability to request, label and comment, um, answer and ask questions and engage in conversation. Um, early, early communication skills are a necessary foundation for development of more complex language, social and problem solving skills. And deficits in communication skills are not always, but are often a result of the interaction between the child's learning history and contingencies within their immediate environment. Okay, so when we think of behavior analytic approaches to teaching communication skills, we can generally categorize these into two different um, cate categories. So first we have direct teaching, um, and then we also have indirect teaching. Direct teaching is what we typically think of as teaching trials that include instructions, prompting, reinforcement, um, and error correction if needed. Under indirect teaching, we have several different methods, including stimulus equivalence, relational frame theory, um, matrix training, and instructive feedback. Um, we're going to go more in depth on these later, but in summary, direct teaching involves more explicit instruction where and structured learning. Um, whereas indirect teaching focuses on skill acquisition within more naturalistic contexts. Okay, so um, as for direct teaching, we're going to be focusing mostly on um, uh, DTT. So this is what this is more of those like structured learning opportunities where an instruction is delivered, the learner responds, and a consequence follows, which might include reinforcement or error correction. Um, we often use DTT to establish early learning skills so that then we can teach more complex later, more complex skills later on. Um, and DTT typically is highly controlled and individualized to the learner, um, and it happens outside of more natural conditions. Um, okay, and an example of DTT might look something like this. So first we have the instruction that is delivered, such as what type of animal is it? Then the learner responds frog. And finally, there's a programmed consequence, which might include reinforcement if the response is correct or some type of error correction if the learner's response is incorrect. Um, and it doesn't necessarily always have to look like this. It could be, you know, something like point to dog or um, show me your nose and that kind of thing. So it's not always restricted to this type of instruction. It can kind of be generalized to other skills as well. However, there are some issues with a one size fits all method. Um, and though while DTT is an effective method for teaching targets, there can be some issues, especially with, when working with neurodivergent populations. Um, so for example, direct with direct teaching procedures, it's possible that we see some more of those rote or automatic responses um, where the learner appears to have memorized the response and does not engage with it on a more meaningful level. So they're not able to generalize that response to other areas um, or different contexts. Direct teaching can also be resource and time consuming because we have to teach all of the skills um, directly which may require multiple trials um, until each target is mastered. In order to measure skill acquisition in direct teaching, we often conduct many trials um, to measure skill acquisition progress, and so it can just take a lot of time. And finally, direct teaching does not incorporate like a, a systematic linear method for continued learning opportunities, um, so there's no um, systematic way of progressing through targets. 
Okay, so to kind of shift towards indirect teaching, um, the learner can acquire skills without any program teaching or consequences. So this means that we're not necessarily viewing this as a, a teaching opportunity where we'll be using prompting or conducting error correction procedures. Um, indirect teaching appears to be more naturalistic and it can be embedded in things such as play opportunities or as situations arise. Um, and it might be something as simple as narrating a child's play like you see here in this example. While neurotypical learners are able to quickly pick up on new information via indirect teaching um, in the natural environment, we know that neurodivergent learners may require additional support um, with this in this area, um, which is why we kind of have shifted more towards those direct teaching procedures. Um, but I think there's some value in, in teaching those skills that are necessary to learn via indirect teaching. Um, and with indirect training procedures, we can train in a way that allows us to get some things for free, which I'll kind of explain that a little bit more later. Okay, so to start off, um, we're just going to go through a couple of these different um, indirect teaching procedures. So um, we have bi-directional naming, um, and this is when the learner can label or identify stimuli in both directions. And it's very important for expanding the functions of language. Um, to kind of make it a little bit more clear, I have an example here. So when a picture of a cow is shown, the learner can say cow. Um, and then, yep, there we go. And then um, vice versa, when we say the word cow, the learner can point to the picture of the cow within an array, um, which it can be something that is learned without tra without direct training. We don't necessarily have to um, teach the, the learner when we say cow, we want you to also, we want you to be able to point to this picture. So it's something that we kind of hope is a, a derived relation, not something that we have to train um, because then we can see how this would take twice as long. Okay, and next we have stimulus equivalence. Um, so this is a descriptive model described in Sidman 1971, um, in which the learner derives relations that are not explicitly taught. In other words, stimulus equivalence is the ability to understand that different stimuli, including like words, pictures, symbols, text, can represent the same concept. Um, and it's often taught with matching to sample procedures where the learner is presented with stimuli and instructed to match them to the corresponding stimuli. Um, through repeated exposure and reinforcement, the learner can develop a, um, an understanding of relationships between stimuli to demonstrate stimulus equivalence without that direct teaching. Okay, so stimulus equivalence can explain language development because it, it suggests a framework of how connections are formed between spoken language, pictures, objects, text. Um, I have an example of what this might look like here. So first we have A, which is the spoken word unicorn. Um, we have B, which is a picture of a unicorn. And we have C, which is the written word unicorn. So let's say first we train two relations. These are these, um, these dark arrows. So from A to B, we train the learner to select a picture of a unicorn from an array when we say unicorn. Um, and then we also train the learner to select the text unicorn when we say unicorn. So we have these two relationships that we have trained. With, okay, here we go. Um, with um, stimulus equivalence, we will see that these relationships are derived conversely. So um, when we show a picture of a unicorn, the learner is able to say unicorn. When we show the, the text unicorn, the learner is able to say unicorn. So we get those kind of, we get B to A and C to A for free. Um, and then since we've kind of trained in this chain, we can, we can also kind of hope that we get B to C and C to B. So when we show the picture of a word, uh, or the picture of a word unicorn, they can select a picture of a unicorn from an array and vice versa. Um, so with using stimulus equivalence, we can train two relations and we get four for free. Um, so it can kind of explain how we teach more of these complex concepts and how we can facilitate generalization of language skills as well. Um, we don't ne necessarily have to teach all of these, these relations directly. 
Okay, so moving on to matrix training. Um, this is another indirect teaching method, and it involves a matrix, which you can see here on the right. So we have two instructional components. Um, on the horizontal axis, we have different colors, and then on the vertical axis, we have shapes. So when combined, we have a colored shape, um, such as red circle. Um, with matrix training, we'll, we will train the diagonal. So we're going to teach red circle, blue triangle, green square. Um, and by training these com combinations, we can also get the non-target combinations, which are the ones that are not crossed through by the arrow, for free. So we're training three, and we're getting six for free. Um, I, I kind of like to think about this as teaching like a little bit of flexibility with language. Um, that's how the SLP and me kind of conceptualizes it. Um, we're teaching that flexibility between like combining um, words. Okay, and now we're going to kind of talk about instructive feedback. So, or IF. Um, with instructive feedback, it kind of goes one step beyond DTT by embedding a secondary target without necessarily requiring a response from the learner or without a programmed cons consequence. Um, so the, the secondary target or the non-target stimuli can be presented before or after the learning trials. Um, and we use IF in conversation with children without even knowing it, typically in naturalistic contexts such as play, um, which I think is really cool. And IF was primarily developed as an instructional method to increase the efficiency and the effectiveness of learning. Um, in the field of speech language pathology, we might refer to this as language modeling or language extensions, where we're restating the child's utterances and adding new information. An example of what IF might look like, um, let's say we show the learner this picture of a pig and we ask, what is this? They respond with pig. And we say something like, that's right, it's a pig, it says oink. Um, so in this example, that instructive feedback is the sound a pig makes. We didn't require the learner to respond to that, um, but we are kind of giving that information for free. Um, we can also kind of say at the beginning, we can say a pig set, or this says oink, what is it? So at that in that example, we're giving the um, instructive feedback at the beginning. Um, so you can kind of see how we might embed these opportunities in play um, just with adding the functions of things, um, things, you know, animal sounds or things that a car, you know, sounds that a car makes, that kind of thing. Um, so it's very naturalistic. And I'm going to pass this on to Manish. Um, why is research on instructive feedback important? Well, for one, it's been demonstrated as an effective strategy to teach novel skills to our learners, such as play behavior or intraverbal responding. Um, intraverbal responding, an easy way to think of that is as uh, it's a dialogue. Um, for example, if I say something like, um, what color is the sky? Um, for someone to say it's blue um, is an example of an intraverbal where um, the question or whatever is asked by the speaker, whatever is said by the speaker is responded to by the listener in ways that's different from what the speaker said. And then it's also been shown to be effective in uh, generating listener responding. Um, Grace kind of gave an example of that, such as pointing to a stimuli um, where we ask the kiddo, show me unicorn, and the kid points to a picture or an object of a unicorn um, and lets us know that they know what we are asking for. Um, as Grace mentioned earlier about the different uh, symptoms or characteristics which allows us to diagnose different forms of mental disorder, um, doing research on any intervention is important because we all learn differently. Um, some of us learn slowly, some of us learn fast. Some of us want visual stimuli accompanying instructions. Some of us can learn just by instructions. And so it becomes important for us to do research in different interventions and in different areas because we wanna find an intervention that's gonna work really, really well to speed up the progress of learning. And in that regard, instructive feedback has been demonstrated to be an efficient strategy which may result in emergent behavior. As Grace said earlier, we can teach our learners one thing, 
but it may lead to additional learning of different components or stimuli um, that we want our kiddos to learn. And so conducting research emphasizes the importance of evaluating novel applic applications of instructions to, to promote verbal behavior. For example, a typical DTD trial may seem like, um, show me unicorn, and the kid shows the unicorn, you say, good job showing me the unicorn. Um, when we add in the instructive feedback component to it, we could say something like a unicorn nays, um, without requiring the kid to say something like the unicorn nays or making the sound. And then we can test for it to see if the kid is actually learning whether the, a unicorn nays or not. And so in that regard, some studies have demonstrated the efficacy of IF to promote acquisition of novel behavior, such as generalization, which is learning to do something in one setting and then doing it in a different setting, or learning something with one person, but then showing that learning with someone else. Um, it has been shown to be efficacious in promoting play behavior and listener responding. However, we need to continue doing research and instructive feedback because there are different components of it, which may influence learning. And the results for those different components has been relatively variable. Um, some of these components of instructive feedback that we can discuss that influence the effectiveness of it are learner characteristics, such as certain prerequisite skills, the ability to point to something or to build the ability to vocalize something um, or the ability to engage in imitation. So I say unicorn, you say unicorn. Um, so ecolalic responding and existing generalized imitative repertoires are important components that we need to evaluate to see if they actually affect instructive feedback. Um, and then there is generalized rule following. Um, this is important because as we advance our skills and learning, there are different um, aspects of our behavior that come into play when we are learning something. Um, learning to relate, um, let's say a pig with oink, um, is going to look differently when we have vocal verbal behavior than when we have to use a speech generating device. Um, so evaluating learner characteristics becomes very, very important. Other variables that influence instructive feedback are procedural configurations. These kind of point us towards what type of targets we are selecting and the number of targets. Um, when we discuss our results and our procedures, you're going to understand a little bit more in terms of how they relate to what we are doing. Um, some types of targets and number of targets that can be selected are based on known primary targets and secondary targets. Um, the primary target and secondary, secondary target, which is the PT and ST, are typically pre-experimentally determined. For example, the primary target could be pig and the secondary target could be oink. Um, in some situations, we pick targets that the child already knows. For example, um, the animal pig. And so we teach them um, that the pig makes the sound oink without having them to actually engage in that response or rewarding for engaging in that response. There are some targets which are called ex expansive targets, um, where the primary and the secondary targets are from the same curriculum. Um, for example, we can teach a kiddo a spoon and a fork. Um, we can tell them that, oh, a fork is used to eating. What is this? And show them a picture of a spoon and require them to tact the word spoon. Uh, there are novel targets where the primary and the secondary targets are completely unrelated. Um, for example, we can teach our kiddos to tact a car but then the secondary target could be asking them to move the car in a certain direction. And then we have parallel targets where um, the instructional components for the primary and secondary targets are different, but they require the same response. For example, I could show you a picture of a frog and ask you, what is this? And you may say frog. And then I might turn around and ask you, name an amphibian. And the response I'm looking for is a frog. Um, so as you see, the instructional components are different. One has a visual stimuli and the other one is an instruction, um, but the response requirement for both of them is the same. 
Other procedural configurations include instruction settings. Um, so you could deliver those instructions at an individual level where you're working one-on-one -on -one with the kiddo, or it could be group instructions where you have a group of children sitting with you and you can instruct all of them. Um, that would look a little bit different because it changes the opportunities of how you can um, reward them for engaging in a particular response. And then there is the order of secondary target presentation. As Grace mentioned earlier, we can either present the secondary target within the antecedent, which essentially means we first provide the information, then we present the instruction for the primary target, and then require a response to the primary target, but not the secondary target. For example, this animal is an amphibian. What is it? The child says, it's a frog. We say, good job, it is a frog. Now, if we were doing it consequentially, essentially what we would do is we would show you a picture and say, what is it? The learner says, it's a frog. And then we add in the consequence portion where we say, good job, this is a frog. A frog is an amphibian without requiring a response to the secondary target. Um, a third component or the fourth component could be in terms of when we conduct our secondary target probes. Sometimes we can do it before actually training the primary targets. And sometimes we could do it after we reinforce this responses to the primary target. Um, Typically, we do probes for the secondary target before we begin intervention. And then once we begin intervention, we could do it um, simultaneously with the intervention where we present our learning trials and after a couple of blocks test for it, or we can wait till they master the primary target and then test for the emergence of secondary target. The order in which we do it is important because it allows, a, it allows us to get an idea of how quickly our children are learning the um, secondary targets without us actually teaching them to respond to it. And the third variable that we need to look at are the behavioral mechanisms. The behavioral mechanisms are different from procedural configurations and learner characteristics, even though some of them might seem similar. Um, one of them is observational or incidental learning. Um, this is, an easy way to look at this is just exposure to a learning stimuli. Um, sometimes we can be in a certain environment um, or in a particular context and something could be going on and we just learn from it without um, any additional kind of uh, modifications to the instruction. Kind of like this presentation. Um, we have a group of people who are listening to us present, um, but we're not doing anything more than just talking about what we are doing. And so that kind of leads to an example of an observational or incidental learning. Um, the second component is demand characteristics, which is what setting are we doing it? Um, in a formal instructional setting, we could sit down at a table and directly teach our kiddo, which is a very structured environment. A second, second component of it could be teaching them during a play activity where they are engaging in play behavior and we naturally embed some of these trials in their learning. Um, so the demand characteristics um, may influence the effectiveness of IF, including things like what kind of effort the child has to put in. Um, as we are all familiar with children with autism, sometimes um, using a speech generating device may be a more or less effortful response for them to communicate with us than using vocal verbal behavior. Then we have indiscriminate contingencies. Now, some of these terms are very jargon heavy, um, but an easy way to understand indiscriminate contingencies is to understand that um, essentially the child does not know whether the behavior they're engaging in is going to result in a consequence. So sometimes when they can't tell whether they are or are not going to get reinforcement for a particular behavior, it can work in one of two ways. Um, sometimes it can generate behavior um, because we are more likely to get a reinforcer. And sometimes we may look at it and say, oh, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to get a reward for this. So I'm just not going to do this. Um, so it can go one or both ways. It can either evoke correct responding or it can inhibit responding. And then we have generalized imitation, which is both um, 
a learner characteristic and a behavioral mechanism because um, if we don't know how to imitate, then chances are it makes learning difficult because these are some of the fundamental building blocks of learning, um, learning to imitate what other people do. And that's kind of where children start um, developing some of their more complex skills. Uh, so this brings us to the purpose of our study. Yes, thank you, Manish. So the idea um, behind this is the broader picture is within clinical practice, there are more, are there more efficient ways we can be teaching our learners? The idea that as professionals, we have very limited amount of time that we have with our clients. So we want to maximize our ability to work with them and help them learn and grow. Um, and then furthermore, to promote more expedient expression. Sorry, no worries. Uh, yeah, expedient learning. Um, we want to look at ways to facilitate effective and efficient learning. Um, so specifically for this project, um, we want to evaluate the effects of using instructive feedback um, to facilitate the acquisition of labeling and categorizing skills. Um, and specifically for social ability, we try to identify relevant categories based on the learner's interest. So for this one, we have two, and they are both enthusiastic about animals, um, whether it be um, toy animals, stuffed animals, um, picture books, etc. So based on both of the client's uh, preferences, we decided to explore the six basic animal groups, um, as you can see here, um, and then identify variables which increase or and or decrease the effectiveness of IF as a teaching procedure. Um, and incorporate participants' preference for type of IF. Um, and we're going to talk about that in the future. Um, bring that social validity, you know, seeing what they prefer, either antecedent or consequence feedback. Um, so for that participants, we, like I said, we have two children, age five, um, and they're both diagnosed with ASD, um, and their pseudonyms, um, fake names, are Mario and Topaz. Um, for both of them, we did do um, kind of assessments of the beginning of the semester each time they're here. Um, we did do the VB map, which is the Verbal Behavior Milestones Assessment and Placement Program and interverbal subtests. Um, and that's just an ability, um, a testing tool that we uh, can use that allows us to see where they are currently at in terms of um, their vocal verbal behavior. So um, whatever context that may be in. Um, and then for both of them, as you can see here, um, one of 2.5 and 139 each uh, respectively, um, kind of seeing where they are level wise. Um, and then for both of them, they receive uh, SBL and ABA therapy at the clinic here um, twice a week. Um, and then this project was incorporated into their regular ABA curriculum weekly. So for material settings and designs, so we um, conduct them all here at CAS in the small therapy room, which is roughly, I would say, perhaps a six by six space. Um, in each room, there is a table and two chairs or three if there's more clinicians. Um, data collection materials such as clipboards, um, papers, pens, et cetera. Preferred items, so what they find reinforcing, um, toys they uh, enjoy engaging with. Um, instructional materials, um, specifically the printed images of the primary targets, such as frog and clownfish. Um, and then, of course, the three sets of stimuli with six targets per set, so antecedent, consequence, and control conditions. Um, again, the setting was here, Cas. And then for the experimental design, we use an adapted alternating treatment design. So simply put, that is between those three conditions, we alternated um, between them randomly. So it might have been antecedent, antecedent, control, consequence, antecedent, um, and just alternated between um, all three. All right. So I'm going to walk us through this just so that um, we're all clear. So as Connor mentioned, we had three different sets. And so on the left side of this tar uh, table, you can see them broken down by set one, set two, and set three. And so we conducted what's called a logical analysis, which has been done um, commonly when you look at things like the alternate, adapted alternating treatment design. And that's really used with skill acquisition um, programs because the issue is that when you're comparing different treatments, the hope is that 
uh, using one intervention that the learner will acquire those targets. And so you have to use different sets so that what's happening in one intervention doesn't necessarily overlap with the other interventions and then uh, skew your data because you can't tell if it's actually um, one intervention or the other. So we broke down the different sets, as I mentioned, um, based on the type of in, uh, the type of instructive feedback we provided. Um, and so you can see that the sets are listed here. Um, and the important thing about using an uh, adapted alternating treatment design is that you want to try to equate all of the sets so that the set itself doesn't serve as its own specific confound. So you can see here that we looked at things like the number of syllables, the number of words, and matching syllables, and we tried to match and control those as best we could across all three targets, or I'm sorry, across all three sets. So you can see here at the bottom for each set, it does show almost exactly uh, the equivalent number of syllables, number of words. There is a little bit of uh, discrepancy, but for the most part, we wanted to make sure that a learner wasn't uh, learning one of the sets due to uh, less response effort, or maybe the words were uh, shorter or less uh, difficult to say. So we wanted to try to equate it as best we could. So that way, in the end, that wouldn't be a variable that might have attributed to why they learned uh, set one over set two or set two over set three. Um, and so we'll talk about the differences between these specific types of instructive feedback in just a little bit, but wanted to make sure that um, everyone was clear as far as how we broke down the sets and what the purpose of that was. Yeah, so for data analysis, um, for the master criteria, which is basically um, at what point do we, uh, at what point do they learn what we're trying to teach them? So for the primary target, it was three consecutive blocks at 80% um, and above independent correct responding. And then for the secondary target, again, 80%. And then for the IV, which is the interverbal probe. So um, the absence of that picture card, just simply asking them, oh, what type of animal is a frog? And hopefully they would answer reptile. So those were the master criteria at which point we would, um, I guess you would say terminate treatment and then move into a future phase or into other targets. Um, and then the efficiency analysis, um, basically, again, the idea of which one's more effective. So antecedent or consequence feedback. Um, and basically, which we'll talk about in the results um, in the future but kind of seeing how many trial blocks it took to reach that uh, that criteria. And then finally for IOA, which is inter-observer agreement, which is when um, two independent sources um, have the same data um, and you compare those. We had 61 and 91% of sessions uh, respectively for the two participants. We calculated that trial by trial across conditions for all conditions, uh, across all conditions for all conditions. Um, and that's simply, you know, comparing the dash sheets and then seeing if there's discrepancies between the two and recording that. Um, and we'd had high IOA, so 99.1 and 91% respectively. And then for procedural fidelity, we do have um, data. We're just still compiling it and it's forthcoming. All right, so I'm gonna walk us through the procedures just because they are a little bit intricate and just highlight some of the differences between the two participants. Um, so here you can see a flow chart that breaks down the general procedure for both participants. And then on the left, you can see our Mario's uh, procedural adaptations. And then on the right, you can see our Topaz's and I'll highlight those a little bit more in detail in just a minute. Um, but for baseline, we basically presented the picture stimuli and asked the individual what it was. We also asked them what type of animal it was just to make sure that they did not already have these responses in their repertoire. And then like we mentioned for the intraverbal probe, that was asking the question in the absence of the picture. So in this case, we just said, what type of animal is a blink? In this case, the animal example was a capybara. Um, and then from there, we um, assessed that they did not have these uh, targets. And we did that for each of the diff three different sets that I uh, mentioned. Um, for intervention, we then moved into looking at the three different types of, uh, or sorry, the two different types of feedback, and then we had a control condition. Um, so for one set, we had the antecedent instructive feedback. And so this looked like providing the instructive feedback at the front or in the, as an antecedent of the instruction. So for example, if I presented this picture, I would say this type of animal is an amphibian. And then I would ask them uh, what it was, in contrast, when we provided consequence feedback, we would then ask them what the animal was, 
And then as a consequence, we would let them know, you know, if they were right, we'd say, you're right, it is a capybara, a, a, it is a type of mammal. And we used all the conventional discrete trial teaching procedures like prompts and error correction as needed um, for the individual to learn both the secondary target. And then as we've discussed, there was no direct teaching of the secondary targets or the instructive feedback. Uh, for the control set, it was essentially the same as far as the discrete trial teaching part went. Um, in this case, we just taught them what the primary target was. So in this case, the puffin, but they were not given any feedback. And that was to allow us to um, compare, will they learn what the category of this animal is or this uh, stimulus is in the absence of any feedback? And so of course the goal here was that they would not learn it because we're not providing any uh, secondary uh, feedback in these, uh, in these cases. All right, so for both of the learners, they went through those uh, same procedures. And then, like I mentioned, there were some modifications that we had to make. Um, so for Mario, and we'll look at this in the data in just a minute, we noticed that he was not ever repeating the secondary target. Um, and when we talk about uh, the results in the discussion, we'll talk more about this. But one of the um, assumptions of instructive feedback and some of the other derived procedures is that the individual may be engaging in what we call echoic behavior. So they're repeating back the uh, feedback in this case, either covertly, so in their head or out loud as a overt response. Um, so for that reason, we noticed that Mario was not engaging in any of those behaviors. And so we started prompting him just with one uh, target to engage in that behavior. So when we asked him what he saw, he would uh, correctly say capybara, and then we would provide the feedback, and then we would immediately prompt him to echo. So we would say it's a type of mammal, say mammal, and then we would reinforce that. So we wanted to see if um, providing that uh, prompt for the echo would then facilitate future uh, acquisition with his secondary targets. Um, for both of the learners, we modified, we noticed that they were not um, responding to the secondary target instruction. And so what we were seeing was that uh, we would ask them what it was, they would respond correctly. Um, but then when we would ask them what type of animal was, which would be the secondary target probe, instead of saying, in this case, mammal, they would just repeat the same uh, word. So they would just continue to tell us it was a capybara or a frog or a clownfish or whatever it might have been. Um, so at that point, we decided to modify the way that we were asking it. So we uh, acknowledged that it was a capybara, since that is correct. Um, but then we asked them, but what type of animal it was to see if that would better facilitate the secondary target uh, response. Um, so we did that for both Mario and Topaz because we were noticing they were both engaging in that same, just repeating the primary target behavior rather than giving us the secondary target behavior. Um, and then for Topaz, as I mentioned earlier, we um, uh, noticed that he, that did not facilitate learning. So at that point, we decided to only focus on the intraverbal response. And so we removed the pictures completely and just asked him what type of animal is a blank to see if um, he would respond without the picture present. And we'll look at his data in just a minute. Um, and then for one set of uh, targets, we uh, started reinforcing the um, correct responses during the interverbal probes, which we'll look at in just a minute. Um, at the end of the, um, once they learn the secondary target feedback, as we mentioned, we were interested in preference assessments and social validity. So we did look at that. Um, and then as the final step, we will also be considering generalization and maintenance to uh, more naturalistic contexts and settings over time. Oops. Okay, so let's look at the data. Um, so I know this graph has a lot in it. It's again, an adapted alternating treatment design. Um, so I'll walk you through it. Most, all of the graphs look very similar. So I'm just gonna highlight here and then it'll be the same for all the other results. Um, so on the X axis are the training blocks. On the Y axis are the percentage of correct responses. And then here we have each of the different sets broken down by color. So antecedent is gold, consequence is blue, and then the control responding is in green. Um, so you'll see in baseline that responding was relatively low across all three sets. Um, he did master the primary target, which was just the initial label of the of the picture. So frog, uh, clownfish, capybara, et cetera. He did master that relatively quickly, which we saw for both uh, Mario and Topaz. Um, but because we weren't yet seeing secondary targets, which I'll show that graph in just a second, uh, we continue to um, still work on 
the primary target acquisition. Um, so this graph is a little bit more um, intricate, but I'll highlight again a couple things. So on the secondary y-axis, we have the percentage of echoics, and those are indicated by the gray bars that you see here. Um, and then you'll also notice there are some probe data, which I will highlight when I get to that part, um, looking at whether he learned um, not just from the picture, but could also answer the questions when the pictures were removed. So in baseline, again, we see uh, relatively low responding for the secondary target. So this is asking him what kind of animal is it? Uh, we don't see any um, increase in acquisition for him uh, as a response of just the general instructive feedback across any of the sets. So as I mentioned, we started prompting the echoic, um, did not see a huge change in his responding. So that this is where we um, moved into the other instruction where we said, yes, it is a capybara, but what type of animal is it? And you can see here that um, responding did start to increase based on these two um, sessions here. And ultimately we did see that Mario met mastery based on this dotted line at 80%. And so we were successful in demonstrating that he was able to learn um, the secondary targets through instructive feedback after a couple of modifications. Um, but unfortunately, here is where I highlight some of the intraverbal uh, data that we have for him. And so you'll see that he, even though he learned the secondary target feedback, um, he was not able to answer the questions uh, in the absence of the picture. Um, so when comparing the different conditions, which is one of the questions that we had, is, is a type of feedback more efficient um, or effective than the other? You can see here really that there was not a huge difference between the two conditions. He, he learned them in about the same amount of time um, when you compare them to each other. Um, so then we, because he was successful, we were able to move into the social validity component. Yes. So for the social uh, validity, um, there's a complex definition, but simply put, it's the social importance and acceptability of treatment goals, procedures, and outcomes, um, and specifically our clients, as well as, of course, uh, caregivers, stakeholders, such as parents and caregivers, invested in treatment. Um, do they think it's important for their child and for themselves? Um, and we did that two ways. First, we did a condition um, preference assessment based on the color, so for antecedent and consequence um, and control. And then we did... Um, for training the control condition because we didn't want to just not ever have them contact the secondary target with that specific set. Um, we saw which one they preferred um, during training. Um, and then, so these are the two graphs. So um, simply put, MSWO is a multiple stimulus without um, representment uh, pressments assessment. Um, and that's simply, you know, have an array. And as they pick them, they're removed um, until there's none left. And you repeat that several times. Pair choice is similar. You have two choices and they consistently make choices between the two and you uh, present them alternatingly. For both, as you can see, he preferred green, but second to that was yellow um, and then blue. Um, and it kind of makes sense because you, you can see here when we were training the control condition, he consistently picked yellow um, as in seen by just an increasing steady trend. Um, interesting enough because he may have been picking green because in that one, it was considerably quicker by perhaps 10, 15, 20 seconds because he was not encountering that additional secondary target information. So it was consistently quicker, but for the yellow, um, that was second picked. And then we see in that graph that he did pick it. Um, and then for the results, um, as Dr. Soller said, we saw very little difference between the antecedent and consequence um, feedback. So we want to evaluate the environmental barriers that could potentially um, affect that. Um, and then we evaluated the role of echoics, which again is just uh, repeating something. And we, as she said, we did start to do that. Um, we did not see a massive um, increase in echoics based on that procedure. Um, and then as far as stimulus generalization, um, as repeated uh, earlier too, um, he what he did meet master criteria for the secondary target with the pictures present, but without them present, he was unable to meet master criteria and responses are still low. Um, and then finally, um, evaluate the lack of stimulus control. Simply put, the uh, the context, um, the addition, the the presence of a contextual cue, um, that is type. So, um, especially for this uh, client, we started to, in addition to repeating, um, asking again the second target, we tweaked it again. So it would look like, um, what is this? They would say capybara. We would ask him what type of animal it is. 
again, they would say capybara. At which point we would say, yes, you're right, it is a capybara. But what type of animal is it? Uh, and then saying what type would then, um, in his case, it did provoke the, uh, well, yeah, um, the um, correct um, secondary target. Uh, so perhaps he just did not understand the question as it's being phrased. Um, yeah. And then, as we talked about, an increase from zero to 83%. And so forth. All right. So I know we're getting low on time. So I'm going to quickly go through the results for Topaz. Uh, graph is set up the same way as I previously explained. As you can see in baseline, there was um, low responding, uh, a little bit more than Mario, but still not at mastery. Um, and he also was able to acquire the primary targets relatively quickly uh, through just direct teaching. Um, so when you look at his secondary target um, data, again, you can see that um, we had to start, or I think I failed to mention in the previous flowchart that for him specifically, we did start reinforcing secondary target echoics. Again, these are shown as the gray bars. So we did see that he was echoing. So sometimes we would say, yeah, it's a type of mammal. He would then say mammal. Um, but as you can see with the gray bars, uh, starting in session uh, 13 or so, um, it did start to decrease over time. And so we observed that. And so at, at this point, we started reinforcing when he did echo um, to because we wanted to continue to see those echoics to see if they would facilitate the secondary target uh, responses. Here's where we made the adaptation that we've mentioned, um, but we still didn't see um, a, a continued increase in responding. We did see it elevate a little bit as compared to previously, but it's still not near mastery. Um, we did notice that maybe there was some stimulus control issues with the presence of the picture, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, so we removed the picture and started doing interverbal probes only, just asking what the type of animal was. And you could see initially we did start seeing uh, by the blue circle and the yellow X's um, some increased responding, which we were excited about. Um, but unfortunately, with the continued presentation of those questions, we did start to see a decrease, and that perhaps might have been due to the absence of reinforcement for those responses. Um, so at that point, we started, uh, we just took one of the sets and we started reinforcing differentially to the correct responses for this set to see if um, the responses were in his repertoire, but maybe just not at strength due to the absence of reinforcement. Uh, however, we saw that he was still just responding about uh, chance responding 50% 50, 50 of the time or so. Um, so we still have not been able to demonstrate the uh, mastery of his interverbal responses yet. Um, here you can see the breakdown for Topaz. So unfortunately, we haven't yet met mastery for the secondary targets or for the interverbals, um, but we were able to see some elevated responding, which is encouraging. So we'll continue to work on him, work on this with him, and we'll talk about next steps um, at the end. But you can see that um, we're still working on trying to identify the best uh, procedural modifications for him. Um, so reinforcing the echoics, although we did see a slight increase after we started doing so, um, it still has not led us to the mastery of the interverbal probes or the secondary targets. Um, we continue to also look at barriers to treatment, just like with Mario, um, looking at that contextual cue of what type of animal, as we discussed. Um, and then we also looked at the effects of the secondary target stimuli, so the picture of the animal masking potentially the interverbal probes, because as soon as we removed the stimulus, we started seeing increased responding to the verbal stimulus without the presence of the picture. Um, but as I mentioned, unfortunately, those responses decreased over time. Um, and so we're looking at whether potentially reinforcing the antecedent um, interverbal responses may carry over to the consequence condition. However, we uh, don't have enough data yet at this point to determine if that's the case. Overall, um, based on the different findings uh, from the two participants, what we can gauge is though both of the participants master the primary target, which is the name of the animal very quickly, um, we did not see the emergence of the secondary target, which is the category of the animal, without additional modifications. Essentially, what this means is uh, the instructive feedback uh, procedure was effective um, as a strategy for Mario, but not for Topaz. Um, the data further indicates that the specific instructions used during the probes did not have any discriminative control over responding for either of the participants. Um, this is evidenced by adding the autoclitic um, 
Autoclitics are basically words that modify a different word in the instruction um, or what we say. So in this instance saying, but what type of animal is it? And emphasizing the word type um, showed that there was an increase in responding across participants, um, not as high as we'd wanted, but high enough to let us know that um, the specific instructions we used were not um, functional. And then the data indicates that prompting the fifth echoic for the secondary target for Mario increased responding, but it was variable and the effects are unclear. So it's unclear why instructive feedback was functional, but we know that echoics may not play an important role in it. Overall, the data suggests that um, the effectiveness of instructive feedback or any intervention for that matter is a function of both learner characteristics and the behavioral mechanisms. For our specific purposes, the procedural configuration um, had unremarkable effects in the acquisition of ST for Topaz, which was a second participant. And there was little difference between the antecedent and consequence responding for Ma Mario. Furthermore, learner char characteristics or an evaluation of that showed that there were no differential effects observed as a function of the acquired vocal verbal imitating repertoire. We did notice that stimulus overselectivity did function as a barrier, which essentially means that one stimuli tends to exert more control over our behavior than another one. And in this case, it was the picture. Um, and it's something that we can test for Maria in the future. Um, and changes in performances were correlated with changes in instructional prompts which gives us a little bit of confidence to say that our specific instructions um, did not have too much control over their behavior. So in the future for Mario, um, we can continue to test stability for the specific preference for which type of feed feedback they prefer, and then retest IV probes to evaluate parallel stimuli. For example, asking the kiddo, what type of animal is an amphibian? And hoping that they'd say either a frog um, or something else that we've trained them to. Or testing the other way around and asking them what type of animal is a frog and seeing if we get any more responding. Um, and for Topaz specifically, we can continue to provide training and then evaluate that if we directly reinforce correct responding during probes in one condition, does that effect generalize to a different condition which allows us to evaluate whether or not having a history with a specific teaching program um, influences how effective it is in the future. And as we continue to do these tests, what we want to do moving in a different direction when it comes to recommendations for future research um, is to get an understanding of, um, are there any specific barriers to learning when we choose an intervention? In our case, there were a few which we identified through the intervention and in and of itself. Um, we need to continue to assess what are the necessary prerequisite skills of learners, which determine who it would work best for and who it won't. Um, in our case, it worked for Mario, but not for Topaz. We need to continue to evaluate the role of Equix to see if they facilitate learning. Um, we could see that in some instances, the children were echoing um, what we were saying, but we don't know if that actually functions in influence, influencing the effectiveness of IF. Um, we need to compare traditional um, teaching procedures such as DTT with IF. The reason being the whole, um, the fundamental idea of IF is it makes learning efficient. Um, considering that they directly learn the primary targets within five blocks, um, but at least for Mario, um, it took almost 24 blocks and 22 blocks to learn the secondary target. We could just as well have taught them the primary and secondary target directly, and we could have, you know, got the results we wanted within about eight to 10 blocks. Um, so we need to continue to evaluate who this would work for to determine whether it's appropriate or not. And ultimately, regardless of the data we get, we shouldn't give up because all data is good data. So we need to continue doing this research um, so we can understand what works and what doesn't. I will let Dr. Schaller take away on this slide.
Well, we ended right at one. Um, it didn't look like there was any questions, so hopefully we didn't uh, cut anyone off from the opportunity. But um, thank you all for your time and for listening. I realized that we forgot to put our contact info on this slide, but if you do have any questions or want to reach out, I can put my email in the chat or you can, I'm sure, ask Shannon and she can pass along our contact info. But thank you all for your time and sorry to cut it uh, almost exactly to one o'clock.